welcome everyone. My name is Peter. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, it's going to be, it's a beautiful day. It's actually also World Environment Day. Hey. So, yeah, you. yeah, it's a great day to spend out on country, learning about how to revegetate, how to heal country. And um, I think this is a real testament to the number of people that are here today. So um, this workshop is a part of the For Nature program which is really about sort of inspiring and building capacity, a capacity of landholders to take on their own projects, to look after country. And I think um, you guys are probably already doing a really good job on your patch. And um, so it's a really good way to sort of bring a lot of people together, a lot of like-minded people and hear how they're sort of doing things and learn different things. And it's really about sort of um, landholder stewardship. So using the land responsibly and also looking after the environment. And when I think of steward stewardship, I think of Anne Ward <laughs> because <laughs> I think she stewards the land really well. So she really sees herself as a custodian of this land. This is, um, you know, a patch that she looks after that she really wants to um, improve going forward. And it's not really bound by the boundaries of her property. It's sort of one part in the greater landscape. And I really think that's commendable. So yeah, and Ward. And then we've also got Drew here as well today, who is amazing. He, um, I go to him with all our questions. He is really well respected in the community. He's worked on many, many revegetation projects and lots of other different projects as well. And he's a wealth of knowledge. And we're really lucky to have him along as well today. So thank you so much for both of us for having Doing, helping us. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So I might hand over to you guys. Hello, um, I'm Anne. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we meet, the Rubandi Saltwater people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Nature Con uh, Conservation for Stewardship Program run by our very own Peter Lerick, who's also, um, many, uh, also the educational officer for uh, the R Patch Program. And of course, Drew, our amazing general manager, our go-to man, so that's fantastic. Um, so in 2018, I bought this block of land. It was uh, half of a six acre paddock. And I built onto this area, which is the only area that was in the paddock and didn't have trees on it. This whole area was 85% Aram lemon then. And I've got some photos over there to show you of that, just to see. Um, and I guess it's just because, you might look at it and think, oh, it's not much, but <laughs> I think it is. It's quite a bit of, but it wasn't for me. It was a lot of work and effort by other people. Um, the aim was to revegetate this and to return it to, and restore it back to, as, as well as I could, into indigenous, um, endemic plants, try and encourage the wildlife to return. Uh, and it's interesting, I had a friend visit the other day and she was walking along the track and when she got to my place, she started hearing all these birds and I thought, wow. And we were just talking about that the other day. Oh, that's, a, that's pretty cool if you can start to feel like you're returning something. As said, I feel like a custodian, not an owner of this land. When I die, it's not gonna go with me. It's um, probably not. Anyway, so I think it's really important that we all do our bit to restore as much country as we can. Um, this couldn't have been done without the amazing work and support of people like Genevieve, Nature Conservation, uh, Genevieve Hannah Smith, Rick Inslee, um, absolute amazing people who came and just gave advice, worked, planted, grabbed other people, forced them to work too. Um, <laughs> so it's been amazing. And now more recently, Fede, who's mm. been absolutely incredible, has a great understanding um, and observational skills, second to none. So. And um, yeah, when we started the, in 2018, the bottom area was planted and that was the um, adopter spot growth um, area, which was the Shire land down the bottom, which I now try and manage as best I can. We put about 1,300 plants there. We put about 1,300 plants onto my property and it was combined blend. Um, since then, we've probably put about 6,000 plants native plants here. Wow. Under the trees and the Maori it's, um, and beyond is all endemic plants, plants to this area. In this front area and up there it's um, endemic but it's also southwest natives as well. So a little bit more scope for a bit more imagination here. 
being careful not to have areas that, you know, if there's anything that could potentially weed, like in the uh, orchard and horticultural area with the chicks, chickens and everything, making sure that everything's well managed up in there. Um, I do have glory vine up on here um, because that's a decision. I, I had to make a decision about a deciduous plant because that's something that the leaves fall gives me summer, summer shade and winter light. Um, I guess today it's about sharing ideas and um, we're all happy to talk and just, you know, talk about successes, failures, what works, what doesn't work. Um, me, like many others, have major kangaroo problems. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and there's areas down the bottom where the plants that we started with, uh, like the acacias, the um, uh, loo and wattles, uh, parasirianthus, a secession plant is a secession plant. So starting with pioneers, things that go in there, be part of healing the land, fixing the nitrogen, and then moving in. Now, some of those plants are now um, getting bigger and it's hard to prohibiting some of the others to emerge. So Fede the other day and I, well, Fede actually got <laughs> cut down, well, I was there. So <laughs> I dropped and dropped plant into that area so to allow the newer generations to emerge. This takes time, nothing happens in a hurry. And if you're revegetating, you have to manage it, particularly in the early times. You have to, because it's not just gonna do it by itself. It, it needs a bit of a hand. Eventually, one day, I hope to be able to sit there and just drink gin and tonic and look out. But <laughs> I think it'll be a while before then. There are other issues which we can discuss, like managing the slope, managing water, um, the challenges of weeds, which I love talking about. Uh, managers of fertility, managing fertility. Because this was a cow paddock, this area is probably more fertile than it should be. So Peter and I, the other day, instead of um, pulling out the cape weed on the slopes, we cut it and I've taken that to the compost area so that that will be managed by being used in the vegetable garden area. The roots staying in the ground to mean that the ground still gets held together during the winter months. So there are things like that that you do. Um, we're a not-for-profit group with a very low budget, so we've got our own loud speaker, Drew McKenzie, <laughs> who will be down the bottom and starting the more formal part of the talk. Um, welcome, everyone, and um, feel free to ask questions. Peter's prepared some stuff to eat, so anyone who hangs around till the end gets to eat, yeah. drink, so it's worth it. I did forget to say as well, um, I've done up a plant list of what Anne has planted here. So if you would like to take that home, make sure you grab it off me beforehand. We also have a lot of um, books, that Jane Scott's books for sale yeah. as well. We use them constantly in the field. They're, they're yeah. our go-to. So if there's something that you want a, a reference book, they're really worthy. So you can grab one of us today. We've got our little square reader. You can just tap and pay. Yeah. Um, and there's a few other free resources as well. Oh, so, yeah. And Jane is a great supporter of us. So thanks, Jane. Yeah. Excellent. This is what we call the riparian zone, um, and the, it's really, really important. This is probably the most important area for us to preserve and look after um, for revegetation because that river is really precious to us all. And this, the type of plants we grow in here is very different to what will go up in that higher zone there. So, yeah, this is all been planted though. So it's quite a, quite a thing, oh, yeah. so A few people were just asking about uh, this guy, Kate Lewin Wattle. Um, it's not a weed. Yep, we do have a lot of uh, weedy eastern states wattles and some of them have similar, similar sort of yeah. leaf to this, but it's, um, it's actually Paraceranthes. Um, so local to this area, amazing pioneer species. I think Anne said, you know, they put this in here a lot, um, but the idea is that it drops out after a few years. And, but in the meantime, you know, it's providing shade, great, um, great weed control in itself, building up that leaf litter, um, bringing in the resources. It's flowering really early. It's already seeding. You know, something, a couple of resources that wouldn't have been in this area before there was revegetation, and so hence a great one to start to bring the wildlife in. Can I please um, just permaculture? Instead of using sort of a lot of the weeds that are being brought in, this is an indigenous that's fast growing, fixed nitrogen. Um, great ducker. Great, great ducker, <laughs> <laughs> which you can make out of the seed. 
Um, it's just a great plant for, as I said, even for um, using as poles in your garden and whatever, it's a good timber. And you can then chop it and drop it and increase the fertility of your soil. It, yeah, it's a beautiful plant for that. And about yeah. as fast growing as we get in this area. Yeah. 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 Mm. What, what? yeah, I suppose one of the first ones is we all kind of have a real tendency to want to plant plants and revegetate. But I think the first thing to do before you launch into it is go, well, do I really need to revegetate? Um, is, you know, when we go onto a property, we know that revegetation, it's hard work, it can be expensive, it's slow, and it takes a long time before you're doing anything like recreating the actual natural good habitat. So if you've got anything on your property that's already native vegetation of some form, the priority might be to look after that and regenerate that and work with what you've got as much as you can. Um, before you start trying to recreate it. Um, and when, you, when I sort of say work with what you've got, that might be the plants that are standing. It also might be the soil seed bank in some instances. You know, you might not have any, you know, X, Y and Z species, but they might be sitting there in the soil seed bank and they might be the actual provenance that is completely sort of adapted and specialised to your area. Um, I think what's also is really important is to be absolutely clear about what your objectives are for planting. Like we all kind of want to plant because it feels good and it's great to watch. But if you can be really clear about what it is you want to achieve, are you trying to buffer the river and provide a <coughs> habitat corridor like um, Anne has here? Is it for aesthetics? Is it for erosion control? Is there some specific species that you're trying to encourage in? It will really guide and determine both where you target and how you go about targeting it. Feel free to jump in with any questions at any time. Um, yeah, so the, you might want to build upon, yeah, where, where might you prioritise if you've got a lot of areas that you could possibly target, you know, and we often prioritise creek lines because there's just multiple benefits to those you know not only is it habitat and carbon it's erosion control and they are often in those corridors building upon any existing remnant vegetation because you're gonna it's gonna be so much more successful not only are you gonna get things seeding in from there and 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 uh, fauna coming in but you're gonna that revegetation is gonna buffer the remnant vegetation and reduce the edge effects and weeds incursion into there um, but I mean, Anne's place here is a really good example that, so this planting was about four years ago, Anne? 2018. Yeah, so, and there's still quite a bit of maintenance and weeding and that sort of thing to go on I with. I have a question, um, when it comes to it weeding, because I'm finding that the weeds, depending on what you start with, or like this here, how does that weeds get managed. Well, no, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> up the top there. So, what did you have to start with? Because I've got kikuyu and there's no. Okay, I had kikuyu on there, and I actually use glyphosate yep, okay. on that. Um, I try up the t so cape weed. I often, well, on the slopes, I try and just cut it. Um, I have a massive seed bank in the blocks above me, so I'm never going to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. But I can use the, by, I can actually reduce the fertility of that cow paddock by cutting them, composting them. It becomes part of my veggie area, so it's a, it's a bit of a win-win. If I, it's just keeping up with it. When I'm a bit like this morning, when I ran out of time doing that, I just whipper snipped it. So there's a lot of whipper snipping going on in here. Yep. The arum lilies we use, uh, chlorsulfurin. Um, I don't see it any other realistic way when you've got that level of um, not to manage it. If you've got small areas, you can. Um, we could go on about bridal creeper, where the rust, we can talk about that later, but where, where the rust, which often starts in the bottom here, and I did, can blend it up, spray it, and that manages it. You don't get rid of it, you can manage certain weeds yeah, yeah. like that. Can I just ask, does everyone know about the bridal creeper rust? Sorry, I shouldn't have been... No. One, of, one of the really successful bio, biological control agents that we've had. So I think when I started with 
Cape to Cape Catchments group about 15 years ago. One of the first jobs we were spreading it along this river for yeah, well done. And Bridal Creeper was just curtains, it just yeah. you know creating curtains all the way up into the um, vegetation. And now you see a bit of it around, but it's not an issue, and you barely ever see any seeding. And so it's been really successful. Yeah. What is the rust? It's um, well, it's a fungal. I'll show you. I'll show you some. Oh, the, the spray. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's from the bridal creeper or from something else? It's been introduced as a you know a, yeah after lots and lots of research. Yeah, and there was also a, a bug that was introduced at the same time, but it never really took off here. But that's been quite successful over east. Yeah. What are the chances of getting a biological control for Aram? Uh, well, CSIRO is looking at it. Yeah. There, there has been one look at it. Um, they had a look at it oh, 10, 15 years ago, but they had kind of one hand tied behind their back at that stage because there was still like a cut flower industry and they, they weren't allowed to consider anything that might have impacted the flowers. So now they're having another look at it and there is a couple of things they're interested in, yeah. but... They need a bit of coin. That's about yeah. as good a weed control as yeah. you get in your initial um, reveg. Yeah, shade this competition. Sort of, this sort of yeah, competition. <laughs> this sort of plant here. Carolina Crestfolic. Yeah, yeah. Ground covers yeah. is sort of the aim. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Ground covers yeah. is sort of the aim. Yeah. Spread wide, but as you said, that too, it, it's amazing like that because a plant like that um, manages to suppress a lot of weeds. So that's really what I'm looking at now. Now I've got the sort of high, medium, some low, it's ground covers. It's really trying to sort of work with that and looking at whatever, and, and it's, it's, it's obs observing what works and what doesn't work and where. Something might work here, not even sort of a bit further up or whatever. So this uh, weed that we've got here, this is the introduced grasses, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ah, so, interesting, because I will show you some areas up there where I'm actually transplanting microlina in patches higher up very successfully. And I'm really excited yeah. by that. So I'll show you that later. That introduced that, uh, introducing what was the original grasses yep. to see if it combats this stuff yep. which just turns out to be a carpet yep. but does it actually affect any regeneration of seeds or the natives does, i know it grows tall and i have to keep cutting it but is I, it a problem? I, I feel like when it's thick yes it can certainly yeah. have a crack i know when reveg gets to this sort of stage and i think ann said she'd observed it that these guys are already self-seeding yeah. so they get yeah. they're getting up but they're pretty aggressive you know they're, they're pretty um fast growing but i think as this thins out and yeah. which it will really soon and it already probably has well um, and there's areas over there that we've actually like fed i actually chopped the other day to let other plants through and i can show you that a bit mm. later yeah, what, yeah. what happened yeah. a creek line area a big open paddocky area covered in penny wall would this be a good place? Good. Yeah, yeah. Th this grows best with a bit of moisture yeah. in the mix. So if you were going to do reveg in there, you'd certainly want that as part of it. Yeah. But you've got to bear in mind that after about five or six years, they often start falling over, and some of these are already kind of yeah. getting to that point. They are like a nurse crop yeah. to get your other things through that are going to be there. But they reseed all the time. They yeah. do reseed, yeah. But, but it's part of the getting a new balance out. Yeah. So, and it just allows other things, like that beautiful Hakeerolia folia behind you to um, oh, yeah. come up and, and, and manifest. Interestingly, this has also provided habitat from that really big moth. Mm. Um, mm. And actually, where was that one that we found? There was one that we found. Yeah. That, anyway, they basically come, they um, grow out of these areas and they, they, they start, they must start very early because they distort. And then they come out sort of a few months ago and um, then they're beautiful. There's a good example over here where they've been bur like the sort of boring through and then I think it's yeah. the cockatoos have chewed in and eating them. Yeah. So oh. the, the, the grubs. Yeah, it's a grub. It's a special. Is that the carry moth? They call that the carry moth? I think it could be. I've got it, I've got it online. Yeah, so up I get top. those. Yeah, One of those really big ones. Oh, and they love the they love the peppies and they love the parasirianthus. But, sorry, paras taxandra, but mine aren't big enough for them to go into taxandra yet. Up front, where before you plant, 
it's really important. You, you know, if you're trying to plant into thick kike or you know thick anything, you're gonna your plants are gonna slow down. They're gonna have all that extra competition come yeah. spring. Just you know the last bit of moisture, and they're gonna have all that competition and shade. You really need to do some serious weed control initially. Yeah. And if it's on a small scale, you might be able to do it organically by you know solarizing or. Slow. Steam is an option on a small scale. Generally on our large scale projects, we're still using herbicide. Yeah. And as much as probably nobody wants to use it, it is a bit different from an agricultural setting where you know, you're locked into doing you know, six or eight or whatever sweeps a year out to eternity. You know, it's, yeah. um, it's really it's, considered yeah it's got a sort of um you're going to get through that to a point where you're using very little or no herbicide yeah. what would you do with penny royal on a big creek line area because you, you don't want to let river. it go downstream do you Good. In a, how do you the herbicide yeah well you you, the, you would never spray in like standing water or wet conditions no. so it would be a summer Getting sort of um control in that situation and i don't I, the more we kind of do, I, if, especially if you're on a private property where you're managing that property and you're look, keeping an eye on it, you know, they say that the best ingredient for your revegetation is your own shadow. Yeah. So if you're keeping an eye on it and you go, oh, gee, that pennyroyal's getting away, then you can address that. You can jump on it. Where we do things sort of commercially or in a shire reserve, often we're much more restricted. We get in there, we've got funding for a year, maybe a little bit of follow-up for a, two, a second and third year, and then it kind of needs to stand on its own. Whereas you guys have the opportunity to really monitor and keep an eye on those sorts of things. And perhaps you don't need to have a bare earth policy, but you need to be able to give your plants the best chance in that first year to really get established and get their roots down. Is there a, like a herbicide, is there a better one? Yeah. So no, well you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing anything like that near there. I mean generally white bellied frogs are in good condition habitat, undisturbed ground. Um, so you wouldn't What about goats? Yeah, so I suppose Yeah, so yeah, I mean there's it depends what you're trying to tackle. Yeah. Um, the, the best type is the one, in my opinion, is the one that's the most selective. You know, if we can use something that's selective, like the core sulfurin that we use on Aram is relatively selective and won't affect it, almost all of our broad leaves. So we use that. Some um, times it's recommended to use met sulfurin, but that's far less selective. So we're trying to use the, the most selective and targeted one. Um, you obviously can have your sort of... Um, your like frog friendly glyphosates and that sort of thing which um, just don't have the surfactant in there which has less of an impact um, it's a lot of it's about the timing and the way you apply it as well so that you're using as least amount of herbicide yeah. as possible yeah but that you know glyphosate won't won't tackle everything as well you really need to know what species you've got to deal with and, and what um, herbicide's going to work best and get your timing right like with kike, you know, some people go, oh, gee, kike's really hard to tackle. But if you get that at the right time when it's actively growing, it's, it's quite easy to control, really. Um, yeah. Do you use flasher ever? Um, we've done a few experiments and that with it and trialled it a little bit. I've had mixed results and I've heard a lot of feedback of mixed results. Um, we had, we, for example, another alternative, we did a really big um, reveg out sort of just west of, uh, sorry, east of Quarum up a couple of years ago, um, Peter and myself, 5,000 plants, and the landholder was really opposed to using any sort of herbicides, and in the end they did, we, we just, they did do a little bit of an area where we just sprayed holes rather than a blanket spray just spraying holes so that that plant gets a free run at things for that first year or so and then the other part of the site they didn't get to doing that and they just whipper snipped right and they just whipper snipped right down to bare ground and we planted into that and we were and it actually was quite successful um that worked okay but if that had been kike 
I don't think it would have worked so well. You know, a kike would have just jumped back twice as hard. But <coughs> horses for courses. What about the sour stop? It's a curse. <laughs> Good. Yes, yeah, that's... <laughs> Anyone got any ideas on how to um, manage sour socks? Um, I've covered, I've burned, I've sprayed. I know some herbicide options, <laughs> and other than a lot of manual labour, I don't know, Fede, do you deal with that much? Yeah, no. no. Yeah. I have so much trouble People with People have got woody weeds, but there's, um, it's, a, it's a herbicide vigilant, but it comes in a gel with a sort of a brush tip. So for cutting and painting, absolutely completely targeted only going on to that plant no no over spray no sort of aerosols that you're going to inhale that sort of thing so there is some like really nice targeted techniques um in terms of like species selection i think um what we really what the way we normally do that is we look for a reference site so Anne's place, she didn't have much of a guide to go on other than 80% Aram and um, a few Marys and things. But we're looking for a reference site. What's a similar place in a similar part of the landscape, similar soils that maybe is relatively undisturbed and what's growing there? Um, and trying to replicate that as much as possible. Um, what we might do in our first year of planting, we might not exactly replicate what's in the mature you know, established vegetation. Often some of those things, A, you can't, you might not be able to source it from the nursery. They might not have cracked how to germinate it yet. Um, and it may not do very well under the really harsh conditions of, you know, what was a bare paddock or, or arum lily. It might not like full sun, might not tolerate the ruse, etc. You might need to modify that a little bit in your first year, pumping in more of these colonizers and then three, four years down the track, you can build in some of that diversity once you've got um, the, the, the conditions established. Can I also ask you, in thinking about re-establishing plants, we've now got to consider the fire risk, where the Absolutely. fire is come down and they go, or all the plants are too close together, etc. Yep. Um, how do we manage that? Uh, with difficulty, I think. Um, I think you want to be really clear on what your fire regs are, absolutely upfront. Um, I think it goes, it, it's a really good point. You know, we go out to a lot of places, a lot of um, farms or whatever, where people go, oh, come and have a look at my reveg. You know, it's you know, 10 years old and it's this big or whatever. And you get out there and you have to break it to them that you've planted some weedy wattles or those eucalypts are actually you know victorian species or something they're a bit weedy yeah. you want to take the time to get it right up front don't just take what you can get at this time of year where, oh the nursery's only got this you got to think about it this is like a labor of love for 10 mm. 20 30 100 mm. years yeah and you want to get it absolutely right up front. And fire is one of those considerations. You want to know what the current regs are. You want to probably understand your own appetite for risk and um, management. And I think you need to consider that. And I, and, and, you know, everyone's got their same own level of risk, but you're probably not gonna bet on the fire regs getting any more lenient in 20 or 30 years time. Mm. Um, in, from the sort of legal side of it yeah. and so I'd be really conscious of that and you know if you need to get someone out just to give you a, a one or two hour kind of assessment and some yeah. advice yeah. It's, it's a really worthy investment yeah. I've actually Where, been introducing mallies because but I, they're not native right no. so well we've got our own Hamlin Bay mallee a priority well, no, I'm species looking at mallees only because if a fire does go through and burn me out I'm thinking well, oh god the job plant replanting so I've done azanthereas um zamias I'm looking at and um the uh mallees so I notice when they get burnt they just reshoot well yeah. bear in mind that one of the unburnable eucalypts is the um black bud the other thing is that when we went to Kingsley Dixon's up, garden, he's thing. actually got some riparian jarrahs that don't burn. I think it would depend on, I think it's the man of um, mm. aluminium in the, it was some sort of strange, in, in, yeah, there are things that don't so burn. So things that don't actually flame up. And like if you've it. ever tried to well, burn a black but hopefully you have, they don't, it doesn't burn. No, I haven't got any black no. but, 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 but
it's about asset protection anyway like oh, yes, yes. we sort of the, the bush will burn but yeah. um unfortunately we've put so many houses into bush areas um and that bush really is protecting us as a species mm. so we actually do need to take we've got to make our decisions here yeah. so what you do is you protect your assets well yeah. i'm protecting my asset well because yeah. that's what i feel is important yeah. um but i also need to protect nature yeah. so yeah. Yeah. it's the balance yeah. and we've got to work out how we're going to do that best yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cannabis species, things like Jarrah would die back and um, Mary would tanker. Yep. Are there now disease resistant species available or hybrids or breeding going there, on? There is Phytophthora or dieback resistant Jarrah available um, in very limited supply. Right. Um, we have been part of a, a planting, you might have noticed it, it's out on off Osmington Road where there's about a hectare or so set aside where they've planted pure marry and they've planted all these different provenance marry across all of its range and they're trying to study that and understand whether any you know subsets of the the you know the genetics are more tolerant of canker um, the results of that are probably a few years away still even though that is probably eight years in or something but what we do know you know is one of the you know, the, the, a lot of the recommendations and things so far have basically been trials and hunches, but one of the constant recommendations is have It'll as much mulch, leaf litter, all of that sort of thing. The Mary canker is absolutely nailing our Marys, mm. but what they found is only on the edges. So road sizes, edge mm. effects, once you get 100 metres into good bushland, it, it mm. almost drops out of the system. Yeah, that's yeah. important. Yeah. So what we're doing here, yeah. it may not be perfect, but it's one of the few mm. things we can do to help our Marys. Yeah. And one of the things I've also done is planted a bit more diversity. I put Jarrah in here because this was actually part of Jarrah country anyway. So I put some Jarrah in black butts because this is black butt country, but no new ones. So mm. increasing the diversity of trees yeah, is really yeah. important, yeah. but trying to maintain its endemicity where possible, I guess. And, and we can manage dieback. It is um, really labour intensive, but if you've got Jarrah that you want to save, you can inject them. We've got a kit and everything, and you can you can manage that. And same with your banksias or your grass trees or, or everything. Yeah, yeah. monitoring. Um, it's we're kind of really good at launching into projects, but I think if you can take a few photos. And especially if you can establish photo monitoring points, one of the great things that Genevieve's done with the Aram and yeah. you've got the photos of it, showing what the difference is mm, yeah. before really you start. Because cool. our memories are pretty average <laughs> and they it gets fuzzy. But if you've got it there in black and white and you've got your 80% Aram cover, then no Aram and now this, it's good motivation, hey? And it's a good... Um, a good memory but the other thing that you could do is just observe what sort of birds are using this area you know as a paddock you're not going to see a great deal of diversity now we've got cover and shade and flowers and seed and all of that sort of thing and you know grubs for you know uh, the cockatoos to eat you're building in that and I think that's one of the big rewards we focus a lot on the plants because they're easy to kind of pin down and identify but a large reason why we do it is for habitat and if we can monitor that and get in touch with that i think that really tunes us in and, and helps keep it going um yeah we can we can walk down and talk specifics i suppose clear all the timber off their block clear the trees because it's a fire risk <laughs> you look at the leaves up there that's it's mulch, it breaks down into compost and soil, it's not a fire risk. And so a lot of the time with plants and stuff, if a big tree comes down and it's sort of a hanging limb, I might just chainsaw it onto the ground, leave it be. It's habitat, it's erosion control, I keep it sort of, if, it, if I'm managing it, it's vertical so that it manages the water across the land. It's actually a magic thing, it's not a risk, it actually needs, and yeah, we keep it don't get rid of it and here down here every time I've got sort of spare logs I chuck them here because 
this area was just, well, this was a track. And um, this has had a, it, it, it's really been a successful revenge. I mean, those, that, that black bud is four years old, you know, it's pretty good. Is that four years old from Shoestock Camp? Yep. So, so most of what we use in reveg is either tube stock or cell stock from you know the sort of forestry trays that have you know 64 or 72 cells in there and you know a lot of you know landscaping or whatever is much larger plants but i think these catch up pretty darn quick in in the long run and often are more hardy in terms of um getting that's fruit the, is that like, that's one of the rules of navies isn't it start yeah. as small as possible yeah. the better chance of I would say that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's just cheaper. A hell of a lot cheaper. And you don't cry when the kangaroo pulls you yeah. out. <laughs> well, you do, actually. You still cry less. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of couple of interesting species here that's worth talking about. Um, got your sword. Really. <laughs> yeah, sword sedge here, Lepidosperma. Show a nicer one. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to talk about it because the roos are obviously hammering that really hard. It's one of the species we love to have in the understory yeah. on our creek line. Holds the banks together, provides really good habitat, especially for things like quenders. Um, that uh, you know, a lot of people always said, "Oh, Watsonia is great for quenda habitat." Well, this is kind of the same once it gets established. Um, and it's really hard to source. We can never get as much as we want from the nurseries. And often they're about four bucks a pop as opposed to, you know, a dollar or two bucks for the other things. But getting hammered in this situation, but not in every situation. Yeah. It's the, the ruse are really hard to pick, you know, and <laughs> yeah, so, so this species here, the Coralina, that um, I've had people swear black and blue, oh, they're rock solid, they're bulletproof with roos. I know Fede is not far from mm. here and he reckons they hammer them at his place. <laughs> but yours look mainly okay, hey? Yeah, no, mine are really good. And that's yeah. one of my go-to plants for me. Yeah. Coralina C-H-O-R. Oak. Oh yeah, Carrioke, <laughs> but Coralina C-H-O-R-I-O-A-E-N-A. -E Really and, and they're an amazing plant because they're really versatile. You'll find them, not very often, but you'll occasionally find them snuck into the coastal heath, you know, as part of the coastal heath mix. Mm. But then you'll see them back here along creek lines and um, obviously in the carry forest. Yeah. Quercifolium. Quercifolium. This is a prostrate form. Prostrate form. form. Mm. Otherwise you get big tree forms, so be very careful. <laughs> sort of, um, sort of large shrub, eh? Hey? Sorry? Large shrub. Yeah. yeah. The other one that's looking splendid it's over here plant. is the Melaleuca in flower oh, here. That's what I was gonna I love that. Yeah. It's so beautiful. That one, is that, how big is that Um Not a lot bigger than that. Yeah, I've got some probably larger specimens down there. This is the beautiful <laughs> Hypercalum angustifolium, which has a, it's a white myrtle, it has beautiful white um, flowers. And when it, when it flowers, it's just, um, Stunning. There's about um, there's probably about four plants in this lot. It, I find it's really successful and goes really really well. It's the idea of trying to have the same species quite close together. Uh, this was part of the school project, so oh. it was a little bit random. But oh, that's I actually good as it's turned out. I, mean, no, I just wondered if you're kind of caught up in a big tunnel. Uh, when you've got school projects, it's yes. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was that called cool again? That one's Hypercalama and Gustafolium. Well, what's a common name? What? Uh, is it called white myrtle? But there's also the, 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 there's a pink one called Hypercalama robusta too, which is also a little pink. Do they obviously need a bit more moisture? Yeah, well, this is what, what this area was called. Yeah. It, it, it certainly stays wetter for longer. So you see them a lot near granite outcrops, so where you've got those shallow soils that get wet up really easily in winter but they must be able to handle a bit of dry settings it's um it's uh either native willow or wanich is the wadandi name or calistachis and um really fast growing it's a pea so it's nitrogen fixing fast growing but as a bit of a general rule i find the things that are nitrogen fixing so either wattles or peas they're nitrogen rich and the roos seem to have a bit more of a tendency to hammer them. Um, whereas you'll see a lot of the species in here 
are actually myrtacey, so aromatic, really oily, possibly sort of basically some, um, you know, some of that defensive, that chemical warfare against herbivory and grazing, and they do tend to do a bit better where there's a lot of ruse. Is Calistaki is considered like a fire burden? Did you say? Or? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure on that. Yeah, I'm not sure. This is um, this is the Corazima cordatum, kangaroo nail. Really annoying. But what's interesting is that this, if you then look here, it's been planted in amongst with a around a peppy, and this just flowers up, and it's extraordinary. So. It's just a bit more planting. protected. Yeah, it's the same, same planting, same time. And this one flowers amazingly. So one tip might be to co-plant things because otherwise, I mean, these guys are just... But I have another area where they don't touch and it's like a forest often, so... The other day when I came to see <laughs> Anne on Wednesday, <laughs> there were three roos about 20 metres from her front porch. She was out there with the uh, Shanghai <laughs> trying to move them on and they were basically giving her the finger and just sort of... <laughs> <laughs> So what did you do? <laughs> Well, look what up. look at what she's <laughs> yeah. been able to be achieved. It's pretty amazing. There's obviously been some losses and some replacements. Um, the species is probably tweaked, and it's you know maybe not what you might have yeah. perfectly put in in a situation. It's been it's yeah. been filtered through the kangaroo filter. I have a kangaroo <laughs> filter, and it's really important. So there are areas further up if we get a chance to get up to there, which I've planted because. The plants that I know, kangaroos won't nail, mm. and if they're sort of low, low in areas that I don't spend a lot of time in. Mm. They're better off with species that they won't touch. Mm. And I have other techniques like kangaroo go away sticks that I put inside bags and stuff like that. Yeah. Brushing a middle one in the middle, so if they're trying to poke their head in there. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, people swear by blood and bone sprinkled around the plants, but it doesn't last very long. You know, it's only smelly for a couple of weeks. Um, Vix is another one that people, um, but you know, uh, can you do that on a planting of 10,000 plants? No. Um, which one? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, you see the ones that they're not eating. It's peppermints, it's the, the taxandrias. I don't know. Uh, taxandria, <laughs> harvest sets. That's what it is. This one here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Marianne, like one of the one of the main, main plants under the understory. Can we say that again? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Taxandria parvaceps is a really common species in the understory of the Jarrah Mary forest. What I'll do is these these um, fell over, so I'll um, chainsaw them, get on my bum, and push them onto the sides. And if I've got my friend to help me, I might move it further up and use it as part of my um, water management. Plus also, if you look at it, eventually it becomes just humus, that, you know. Yeah. And there isn't leaf litter that's it going does. to create a I mean, fire. If anything's sticking up and you drop it on the ground, it's going to be fine. It's not going to be a fire. And if we want to live on a bush block, we don't just create a concrete jungle because we're scared of fire. We shouldn't be there if that's how we feel. And that, I feel quite strongly about that. You know, go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So, I do believe you need to spray the cross off room. I can't, couldn't have seen any other way of this happening. Um, but those tiny, so the, the, if you dig it up, it looks like a yeah. kilos of sweet potatoes. And then the big ones, I think you nail early on, but then there's smaller and smaller ones. And I think they'll probably come up 10, 15 years, but it's not a big job. Just no. If you're on a bush block, you need to manage it. And I think that's just what you do. So. Yeah. This, Oh, and if you can't do it yourself, yeah. there's contractors available and yeah. Nature Cons can help you link up with those. And, and did you want to talk about our biodiversity assessments too? That we're yeah, we will. Oh, yeah, maybe. Bilobium bilobum, which is um, which the thing that they derive 1080 from, and it's got a beautiful pink flower when it comes up. So incredibly toxic. You know, three or four seeds, you can just try it, they reckon, can take out a child. Wow. Is that right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, is that pungent? <laughs> another another great seen. plant is the August. This is the um, well. This is a peppy, <laughs> but another one that when you grow around. This is the the Canadia lateritia um, from Augusta, which has got a beautiful reddish pea flower. Um, this one's growing up a tree, but it's really profuse on the ground, and it's a lovely, um, lovely plant. As is one of my favourites behind there, which is the um, Hakea oleifolia. For the first year, the kangaroos nailed it, ripped it out of the ground. The ones that survive, I think it gets a bitter flavour or something. Suddenly they, they left them alone and they're just a magnificent tree. And I, I would like, I, I think that's a fantastic tree. Oh, so much oh. nectar in is spring, eh? Yeah. Hey? Like, wow. you smell them a mile away. What, one thing that someone um, brought up earlier just then was, you know, obviously we've got to get our species right. Absolutely important. You've also got to get them in the right zone. And yeah. if you're doing sort of creek lines or dams, you know, a metre up the bank can make a dramatic difference in how much longer a summer those plants have. But on top of that, mm. you want to get your numbers right. Okay, so you have a look at what Anne's put in here and the spacing of trees and the ratio of trees to shrubs and understory. Because if we're thinking 10, 20, 30 years down the track and we plant a tree every metre, mm. it's going to look like a timber plantation mm. and it's going to be horrible. And you really want to get that mix right and not too many trees. The trees might look good after a year because they've bulked up and you're like, geez, we're doing great, but another 10 years down the track and you think like you might need to thin it or something, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, in here... You right. Um, yeah, this is a Banksia grandis, and I'm really proud of that. But further to the right, that whole area there is, you know, the Corazima that was being nailed? That whole area is kangaroo free and that is just lights up with red, uh, sorry, pink and orange flowers. And it's just a stunning little zone in there. And further along, I don't know, Fede, do you want to talk about that spot that you've, um, did, we did the work on the other day? Yeah, what do you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> that you took, Fede took this, um, this out as well as multiple branches to give this area more light in here because and we're going to have to take this tree out soon, another Parasirianthus, so that the black butt, this one, um, and there's also the, the behind, olive behind you. Yeah, and this Haliot can, can shine so, because now it's their time in the sun. So, you know, these have done, stood their purpose. We'll take them out, drop them onto the ground. They'll create new life and, um, yeah, it'll, it just keeps going. But this is the thing about secession plant. You can't just plant it, walk away, and that's it. You actually have to manage it, particularly since we're planting things in order, in order for them to succeed over other plantings. And one of them is actually assisting in the growth of the other. And one of the, um, in a similar vein, the tipping. So some of Anne's done a bit of tipping of plants so yep. that rather than having something just bolting for the sky yep. in that reveg, it's kind of really healthy if it can spread out and add extra shade and, you know, weed control. Yeah. Not everything, maybe not eucalypts, but, um, you know, some of the yeah. shrubs and things. Mm -hmm. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> so this is Stryptamine saxicola, which is one of my favourite plants. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it is very, very hardy. It's a low plant. And I think it's just, um, and the, the bees love it. And you see a lot of the native bees growing on it as well. One of the ways that I deal with um, this stuff is um, the, the one, the bridal creeper, which is also the one that we're using the rust on is, I pull it out like major carpets of stuff. It's quite a challenge. I try and get big clumps of it and sort of roll it up like turf. And I put them in local areas, upside down with as much soil shaken off and, and just let it go. And people said, oh, it'll seed again. It's actually a really good way of just handling it, I find, is just pull it out, particularly if it's places which is, one of the problems with this plant is it's actually, I think it, the water sheds off it really easily. So if you can dig, if you're planting somewhere and it's near it, you, you roll it up like turf 
get the sand out and, and it actually, I think it allows the water to penetrate, which is one of the big problems with this. These things you had to manage slope and stuff as well. Um, of mine is this Lepidospernum which I can go up higher it's called the Lepidospernum squamatum and this is a really robust little plant that's now starting to sucker out in all of these areas so I'm going to be able to take those and plant them elsewhere but um, it does get a lot of root damage but it also seems to survive despite that um, this was the only flowering plant really I think on the block at the time when I first got here this is the Hibertia cuneiformis I actually even planted more of it but it's got lovely yellow flowers and it's just a beautiful plant there. Really lovely. This is a grass tree or Xanthoria cracei. They say that, you know, they can't grow. These are actually very slow growing and they, and they are slow growing, but they're not bad. And they also sort of, you know, talk about, well, you probably never see it grow really big. Well, so, well, that's not necessarily the point that I get to see it grow really big. Sometimes we just got to plant these things because they should be here anyway. So, yeah. They didn't have any um, grass trees on your property. There are some further up, um, not actually on my block, but on that slope. So I think it's a fair call to grow them. Yeah. Yeah. And I did have somebody who's throwing them out, and so I got one of hers. And I bought one recently, just a small one to put in as well. Have you talked about the Nervelia and the um, oh, you go. You go. So Nervelia is another one that sort of um there's a bit of a love-hate relationship with this you know a lot of people go oh that bloody thing you know if they're trying to get in and go swimming you know barefoot in summer it's really prickly especially when they dry out but it's got a really nice um sort of purpley um pea flower and it's late in spring when a lot of things have already finished and we try and plant it a lot where we don't want people to access parts of the river and it's like natural kind of barbed wire. Um, that with sword sedge works pretty well. Okay, you should pull cella, another one. <laughs> yes, yeah, prickly nose is a good one. And then there's a couple here, this um, net vein wattle or acacia urophila. Um, it's a really attractive one of our, you know, some of our wattles can be a bit scraggly and you might not want them in um, landscaping so much, but this is a pretty attractive one and um, often grows sort of in the slightly moister areas, like maybe on the edge of Carry or some of the moister Jaramari country. It also grows in, the, it's actually here in the river anyway, it grows in the river. It's got a beautiful white flower. Um, and as I said, I can sort of take it up at about as high as here and it's really been very successful. So it's, it's another great plant. The Falsbrone. Falsbrone or Phylanthus something, P-H-Y-L-L-A-N-T-H-U-S. Is that a marina behind you? This one? No, this is, this is another local, it's called Acacia saligna. Another pioneer workhorse. And people sort of said, don't grow them and you'll never get rid of them. Um, but I think there's various forms of saligna. I think the ones you grow from, you get, you get from the nurseries, doesn't tuber and, and weed. Um, but also if you're managing your property, then if it gets too much out of the way, and I have done that, you can chop and drop it or prune it heavily so that other plants can still manifest. But it's one of those pioneers that we talk about and it's part of the secession. You know, it takes time, and that, that's what this is good for. This is um, Jarrah, so I'm growing Jarrah up this area, and it's to help with some of the diversity, because we know that there's canker in the um, Mary, so we're just trying to make it more robust, a bit more bomb-proof. Um, that Mary in the middle there is just magic. Ah, oh, and that's probably about 300 years old. It's stunning. I know. And it's got a... I better get a ladder because it's an arrow right in the thing there. <laughs> No. Go in. So this is the Microlina native grass that I have um, transplanted from down the bottom into this higher areas. I'm sort of in these shaded areas. It actually does really, really well, and I'm going to disperse seed here as well. And I'm just, but it's actually working really, really well. Um, so I just, it's just patience. You've just got to keep going. How do you know the difference between the grass? Yeah, it took me a while. Um, <laughs> it's ident ident identifying. It's a darker colour. You do have to just get your eye in, but if you try pulling out microlina, it doesn't pull out like a lot of the weedy grasses. However, saying that cooch, 
um, does it is pretty hard to pull out as well. But okay. this one's yeah takes time. And that's different from two chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah, much. very much so. The property, as you can see, is very very sloped, and I um, was having to the, the actual around the house has got special membranes and stuff to, and, and drains so that the water flows. And one of the things here is that it flows all on and then we take it all on that road which we knew was going to be a problem yeah, and it all flows down hard. through here so i've created a um so i put lepidospernum and juncus into this and created what looks like a riverway i guess as one way of managing the water that now comes through here it goes under that tunnel there and then it it sits in the um what is like a low level pond here in the um winter so this then becomes an area that then slowly moves through and as you can see the timber there is the way the water is moving on the property so it's just trying to disperse the water slow it down utilize it get it get it going kind of thing um yeah um yeah that's actually this there's a thing called a cycad here or zania which is these ones and i've been planting these in areas too lots of them and they've been very successful they actually mm. so i've been in pots the last year and then i'll just put them out this year and um, i'll probably put about 50 around here in the hope that they mm. grow but they're beautiful little things direct yeah. seeding too eh hey you've done a lot of direct seeding and direct seeding yeah which has also worked yeah, yeah. yes we keep seed find them. <laughs> you need to find them. That's right. So this is in here is all um, natives. You can see that the kangaroos have nailed it, but you've got to concentrate on your wings. <laughs> Otherwise, you need air compressors the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And really, it does work. You just need to. But, but this is about as bad root pressure as you're likely to yeah. encounter. Yeah. This is yeah. almost worst case scenario. Thank yeah, you. yours would be yours would give it a crack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I thought we'd go up and then down here. Mm. We'll look at this area up here then, I think. So, and the end of winter, this is flowing. Is this yeah, still on? yeah. Mm. That's more transplanted micarena. Mm. It's the solar electric fence. I did have it as a single strand last year, and the big kangaroos jump over. The small kangaroos went under. And they've basically quite the nail this area. So now I have doing a double strand and I'm hoping that'll work. Uh, nothing totally works for kangaroos. It's just litigation. At one stage I was using um, sticks like this next to the new plantings and putting Vicks Vapor up because, and it probably worked a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. I've tried, you know, the go away sticks, which has got another turn, which you sort of put into, um, into bags so that, Hopefully they'll poke their eyes out when they try and eat your food. You know, there's, there's lots of attempts that you can give it a go. Um, keeping an eye on them. Often the first night the babies will, the um, young kangaroos, I think the joeys will come along, or the young roos rather, pull out the plant just for fun. So you might find if you go the next day and have a look, you can just replant everything that's lo looking like a stick and half dead and it might work. Because often it's a very early effect. Whether it's the smell of what you've, your new plantings, I don't know what it is, but it does seem to make a difference. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> the first, um, these ones and the peppy, the massive peppies are over there, are all the same age. This thing has been heavily pruned and topiaried um, by the kangaroos. So, but they're surviving, so it sort of doesn't matter. Um, plants that clearly are affected. Beautiful tryptamine saxicola. I don't think this verticordia is looking. That's a local verticordia plumosa, a beautiful pink plant flower. It's lovely. Um, and Westringia fruticosa does not get nailed. So the other thing that is useful here is slope. So they're less likely to go into those areas, so that helps as well. But um, the other amazing plant that I absolutely love here is the uh, Eremophila calbari carpet, which. Um, so I'm actually, so today if we get all time to do some plantings, this is one that it suppresses weeds. It's a big um, ground cover. The roos don't appear to touch it. It's a great plant. So, and I think Coralina quercifolia seems to survive um, as well, which is that um, bushy plant down the bottom. 
but yeah, you can see that these that these guys are doing well. Um, so one of the plantings today will be the Ceramophila onto this area here. Yeah. It's interesting with the peppies, like some getting out and some not. Because I know they say with the ringtail possums, like they're really fussy that they will not eat on some peppies, but they'll always go to one yeah. because there's slight differences mm -hmm. in the leaf chemistry. Mm -hmm. It might be yeah. the spot in the landscape, but there is these mm -hmm. variations that we're not aware of, but they kind of tap right it's into. It's really true. Um, and he says that it's the um, older peppies they'll go to because there's a different taste in the leaves and the younger ones. Mm. So they go to the older peppies. It's not just age though, because like, and it's funny because down there, you, when, you, when they flower, one peppy right next to another peppy, one's got this form where the flowers are going out and the other ones are going drooping right down. They, they look like completely different plants. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of variation, yeah. as you say. Yeah. That's a huge weed source for me. Did, did you have much bracken on your place, and when yeah, you I were did. starting out? I did. And um, how did you tackle that? Well, I it's, it is native and we don't consider it an no. environmental weed as such, but it can, it can chalk up and sort of um, suppress any yeah. succession or regeneration if it's really thick. I think that the Clawsol furin in the first season may have knocked it back a bit. Yep. And I, if I need an area that it's in, I'll plant and use it as, as I'll actually make use of it. I'll use it as a, a cover, mulch. a mulch yep. for it. Yep. And it just seems to naturally not be a problem. Be Whereas if you've got a paddock with weeds, it'll proliferate. Yeah. Like and this. then it's considered a major fire risk. Mm. So, you know. Which is a salt bush, but it actually tastes incredibly yummy. Mm. Um, it's also, the other reason I love it is because it's um, bomb proof. It's, survives really well the kangaroos don't eat it what a win um, another one which is not endemic to here but is the chorea so this area I'm allowed to have southwest rather than uh, uh, endemic so this area I'm sort of planting other species as well Lovely. Lovely. The water that the subsoil drainage around the property comes down into here as well as all the excess on the rainwater and also there's a drain around the water tank for extra water that comes from a big surface. It comes into here and I've planted this is actually Lepidospernum gladiatum, which is not in this quite in this area, but it is a local Lepidospernum. Um, and that's a centella asiatica or goticola, which is meant to be a healing plant with health properties which Trevor would probably know and some native um, sedges uh, I've have got some water lilies in there as well which are not native but that's all right and then when the, it overflows it, into, it overflows into this area and then down into here and then moves across this country so when it's big rain I have to come out and just see does this work or doesn't it work <laughs> and um, I'm always adjusting it because that's what it needs. It's just continuous adjustments and stuff. This is a beautiful grove of peppies, but I think it's actually making it quite difficult to plant under here. So I understand that you're probably best to plant um, that when you're uh, revegetating or um, that you actually start from healthy and go, go into the more difficult areas. Drew, have you got anything to say about that? Yeah, definitely. Peppies can be really hard, established peppies, hard to plant under. They're known to be sort of allopathic. <laughs> so all their leaves are kind of leaching chemicals in there to, that other plants can find it hard to grow through. Um, it's one of our hardest situations is right. trying to get some diversity into pure peppy. Yeah. yeah. And then you see an area like that slope, which actually does very well. That's that um, Canidia lateritia, which is just so that's just abundant with flower. And this slope actually does very well too. I think it's because I can keep the kangaroos off. That um, plant up there, which is sort of slightly taller, is the Bossia aquifolium. And where those sticks are down the bottom, which the kangaroos used to nail, they've killed them. So you just, a bit of geography away from kangaroos makes a huge difference. Yeah. 
done plantings um, on the Margaret River foreshore. One of the western, well, actually, two of the western ringtail possum plantings have been partially under peppies, yeah. and things are surviving. They're just slow. You yeah, just, slow. You, you've just got to be really patient, I think. Um, and I think if you can prep that hole and give them as much of a sort of good food source in there, it helps out. Mm. But it's slow. Um, as good as peppies are, it would be great if it was a more diverse system. Yeah. Um, we're really lucky. Up in Bustleton, there is a, a peppermint decline. You know, it's wow. one of the sad stories that we've got in our southwest is that you know, we've got dieback affecting jarrahs, we've got cankers affecting marries. There's a peppermint decline that's quite a thing up in um, Bustleton. We don't see a lot of it here, but uh, there is certainly a few properties have been out to and seen something going on with their peppies. You've got flooded gums getting affected in areas. Chewets have had issues. We've, it's a real thing with our um, canopy species. They seem very vulnerable. It's one, one of the things with black butts is that currently there doesn't seem to be anything affecting them mm. that's relatively um, resistant to what we've currently got. The peppies seem like they're sort of green. They go yes. They silk yes. they grow. Yep. They cover everything. And, and the roos don't hit them too hard, oh. so they're one of the things that yeah, keep coming, yeah. This is a jarra that I put in three years ago. And, um, yeah, one, one of the things I trying to do, as I said, was diversify, have a, a few other local... Um, species that will um, hopefully, stay, hopefully be around in case things happen to the others. But what we were saying before about right, soil health is so important. Doing everything we can to improve what's here may be, may be part of the solution with any luck. Yeah. Offering like a fee-for-service sort of biodiversity assessment mm. um, service. So if people, you know, ha you know, so many people have got really good intentions, they've got the best ideas and hopes for their property but it's an opportunity to get someone to come out and a tell you what you've got you know what are the assets that you've got there yeah. that you may or may not already know about it provides a baseline as to what's the current condition of your vegetation some mapping of any um, issues like weeds or any dieback observations and those sorts of things sort of opportunistic fauna records that we can observe without doing any full-blown surveys and then some really pointed um, management actions and prioritized actions so that you have a bit of a sort of blueprint going forward so that you know if you're going to invest time or money or parts of your property into conservation that you know you're on the right track and you're probably going to a, get the best bang for your money and try and do it as efficiently and as effectively as possible and don't make those you know, a few, you know, rookie errors that 10 years down the track, you're like, geez, I wish I'd done that differently. Rookie mistake. Yeah, yeah so a lot of the early plantings here, say 20, 30 years ago, were with well-intentioned people, but there wasn't the, the, we didn't have the plants then, I believe. So, you know, there are mistakes in terms of the types of eucalypts that were planted then, you know, with Warcliffe having road having camaldulensis along it and stuff like that, because that was all that was available. We thought, oh, it's a native, it's eucalypt, you know. Wrong one, but we know more now than we did then, so it's a bummer. But. So we do that in-house. Um, we've just got a new staff member coming on that's actually going to sort of own that and run that project. Um, but they're local people who have lots of experience working with local properties, preparing river action plans, doing those sort of that sort of work. What's the cost of those? Um, it it will vary out. depending on the size of the property, obviously, and also the um, the homogeneity of the property. So if you know it's a big bush block with one big bit of bush, then that's a lot easier to assess than something that's got lots of different bits and pieces to it. But we can chat about it. I can give you some indicative costs if you like. Yeah, and then there's follow up with that too, so that it's also just checking giving a plan but also not just abandoning you at that time actually <laughs> you think, well, good, good luck, luck. <laughs> but actually following it through over the years because this is long term I mean, we're, we're here as a not-for-profit because we really care about the environment and because it is under threat so we're trying to do everything we can to um, maintain remnant vegetation to restore to revegetate in the best way we can and this is such a precious area the Cape to Cape region is 
magnificent and it's, it's our responsibility as citizens of this place to, to do the right thing, I think. It's really, really important. It's really heartening too, because we've been doing similar workshops for a long time now, and 15 years ago when we first ran them, it was hard to get right? sort of, yeah. it's hard to get like a, a good core audience, but now there's a lot of appetite and a lot of enthusiasm, and I think attitudes are, are really changing in that respect, yeah. and it's great to see. Yeah. Plant local. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So does anyone have any questions that they yeah. want to ask now? Because what we might do is we might split up and do a couple of little planting zones and sort of, yeah, sort of see how we do it. Just a few little plants and then we'll probably have some lunch and some tea and you can hang around and ask some more questions. Anyone got any pressing questions that they want? Excellent. I reckon we should... Um... Alright. So we've sort of got four zones. Um, Fede's going to take to an interesting area that we found the other day, which is like a kangaroo track that we've, we've discovered. So we're going to try and plant things that we're hoping those bas the kangaroos won't um, take attack um, and trying to make it relatively bomb proof. Um, so there'll be one area going there with some plants of Fede that Fede's got. Um, and Peter's gonna go up to that top area where I talked about um, kangaroo and uh, as I said, do what we can there. Um, and Drew and I are going to go to, I'll have to work it out, I can't remember. I think I'm going there and you're going here actually um, for a replanting. But there's also some riparian plants by Fortia Sparsus. So if anyone's got time at the end, we might do, oh, you look interested. I'll put them <laughs> in your tray. Plant. That's going in Drew's tray. So we just divide up, I guess, into, I think if you've specifically got kangaroo issues areas, that's probably, you know. Yep, up the top. Yeah, Fede and, and, and Peter. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, and we can just show you what we do, techniques, blah, blah, blah. Use things to stop fire, but you need to protect your house. I mean, it's okay, it's easy for me. I've, I had a house, a blank slate. Um, I, this area I'm planning to keep deliberately low anyway for these trees, but also the, the floor is, the ground is brick. It's um, built to a uh, bushfire attack level 29. It's six millimeter glass, it's aluminium frame. I have a fire system in the roof under the eaves i have fire pumps in various locations this is a fire sprinkler system that you're standing on <laughs> <laughs> i've got six of these at the front um, and a fire switch in other words if i want to live here i have to uh, it's my responsibility to manage fire or i can go but um it's really important that the vegetation is still uh treated with respect whatever Foot here, one of her favourite, the Calberry carpet. You guys will be pretty familiar with it. So all really low growing, um, all pretty kangaroo proof. And we're just, she, basically she's giving me the brief, find a little gap and um, put them in with our little trowel. And yeah, we might even, I might just grab a little stake so that we can, um, yeah, so we can figure out where they are and then we'll come in later and, and, and go up and yeah. yeah. Try and make a nice big well, but you almost sort of kind of put it in so it's like flat down. So as the water's kind of coming in, it's going to kind of pull in here nicely and it's not kind of going to just be plonked sort of like down on the, yeah, sort of on the slope. And, you know, a big part of what Anne does is that sort of minimal disturbance and all, almost like no till on the slopes. So you know we're not sort of digging these big holes and yeah so it's really just getting it in enough that looks really nice you know it's not too it's not root bound it's sort of you know it doesn't really need too much of a loosen up it's nice and wet which is perfect all right and the ground is a bit dry up here so i'm just going to loosen that all up so it's not too compact put it in and then pop it back around and then press in so you don't have any air pockets. And then sort of see how there's a nice little well and you've kind of got this well around here so that any water coming down will fit into there. And then I try and just put back as much mulch as possible. And ideally what we will do after everyone's gone is come back and we'll water them in and that will get rid of any other air pockets. So yeah, I'm sure 
a lot of you probably knew that, but <laughs> we probably needed some content. Too. Maybe, maybe one here. Yeah. It's not too much competition with the the grasses, the nutrients. Away. Yeah. Amazing. Nice big root. Planted with love. <laughs> mm -hmm. 